anger in her, she can say, damn it, you know? I'm not going to obey that again. I'm, I'm not going to stop at the edge of the town where I live because this voice says I'll have a disaster. I'm going to stretch the envelope. I'm going to try. And then every time she does that, she gets a huge increment of, of relief and a sense of self-mastery and a sense of, of hope for her future. But when she gives in to the voices, um, which keep her isolated and locked up in the inner capsule, she, she can't do anything. Yes? Do you find that as they start, it's been my experience that there's a real sense of uh, betrayal, inner betrayal, when they start disobeying this inner voice. Too. That's right. Tremendous sense of inner betrayal. The, the voice gets very agitated and will stage all manner of um, hysterical uh, behavior that will convince the person that they are going to go crazy or um, or that this is the wrong path to take. That um, you know, survival inside the system of defense has worked for them within a much restricted life space. As they start to expand their life space, the voice starts to say, you know, why are you doing this? You know, and of course, the the, the big why comes from the anxiety that they experience as they step over that threshold and start to explore new things, or say things that are forbidden, or confess to feelings that haven't been okay. As they do that, they experience more anxiety, and anxiety is what brought the defensive voice into being in the first place. So it's proof, you see that they're on the wrong path. So a lot of what these people have to understand is that they need more anxiety in their lives. And when you say that to them, they think you're nuts. <laughs> they, they need to develop anxiety, anxiety tolerance. They need broader shoulders to carry more anxiety. Because if they can carry more anxiety, they can carry more life. And there's no new life without anxiety. I mean, we all know that. You know? Yes. The microphone. Thank you. Uh, when I work as a vo volunteer crisis counselor for years, mm -hmm. our clinical director would have us encourage our clients sometimes when they were developing new behaviors and experiencing new things to, to have an actual dialogue with their protector part. Uh huh when it would start acting out yes. and to assure it that it wasn't going to be abandoned. That's a great thank idea. Thank it for what it had done. Yes. That's a, a very good way of doing it, and uh, that's been developed in several places I know of dialogue with these dark voices because you have to not um, antagonize this figure. You have to recognize that this figure has gotten you through a lot, and you appreciate his activities, but you're going to relieve him a little bit now. He doesn't have to be quite so vigilant or quite so uh, active because you're taking over some of his functions and he may not understand that um, because he may feel like you're trying to steal his job without a proper appreciation or severance pay. <laughs> yes. patient on um, dialogue with their dreams. Oh, really? And change the course of that dream. I have a citation for that. I, can, I didn't know mm -hmm. Yeah. But I could relay that to you. Well, you know... More empowering. That... Uh, parallel to what we're talking about. I think it is exactly parallel. Um, the, the work that I'm familiar with on, on actual dialogue with dream figures is that so many of these individuals have entirely persecutory dreams. And sometimes they're chased through the dream landscape by monstrous figures and they can't do anything. And so they're encouraged to turn around in the dream and face that figure and find out who, they, who it is. And if you provide enough of those suggestions, sometimes it actually starts to happen in the dreams. And um, also it can be aided by active imagination with those figures. So 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all the same stuff, whether you're working in the dreamscape or in the imaginal world. It's, it's working with these same figures that, that are tyrannical protector persecutors and, and, uh, and, and need to have their power drained a little bit. Um. find that uh, if another traumatic experience comes along that they regress for it and have a diff more difficult time or are they better able to handle it? Uh, what's your experience with that for someone who's been in long-term analysis with you? Yeah, um, generally, I mean, always there's a regression. <laughs> Let's face it, I mean, um, the, the progress here is always two steps forward, one step back, hopefully. Not one step forward, two steps back. But there are those times when there are two steps back. And uh, the thing that we find is that these, I have one man in therapy now for 12 years, actually. Uh, he's been, he's stopped and then he comes back, he stopped, comes back. But we did a really powerful, um, piece of work together for the better part of um, eight years or so and he really made huge progress and he had grown up as a kind of archetypal child. Uh, he'd been a, a boy who, whose brother was born when he was two and apparently he'd had a very symbiotic relationship with his mother up until that time because when the second child came along, the brother, uh, can you hear me in the back if I speak up a little bit? Um, he went into such an agitated state, apparently, this is mother told him this later, that she couldn't handle him and the father couldn't handle him. And he was classically ADD and um, he remembers that, that this led to just more and more tension and abuse. Finally, they put him on a dog chain in the front yard in a harness. They shaved his head. His father was a military man and would whack him with a paddle on, in re regular ritual abuse situations. Um, they had to pay babysitters extra to babysit him. I mean, he, he has as a matter of pride uh, having flunked nursery school. <laughs> he was a terror. He was just absolutely inconsolable and unmanageable as a child. And this led to a whole history of acting out behavior where he, he, uh, he had 16 uh, felonies by the time he was um, stealing, all stealing, and other criminal behavior. And finally, he got himself to hate Ashbury, wigged out on drugs, um, ended up in India, living in ashrams and caves, came back for his sister's wedding at 110 pounds with his hair out looking like he'd been plugged into an electric socket and ended up in Haight-Ashbury where he met his current wife uh, who uh, sort of tamed this monster that he was and he started doing work with dependent and abused children who were, had addiction programs and he ended up being a high school guidance counselor and a coach. But during that whole time, he, he happened to have incredible athletic ability. And a body, you know, you walked into my office the first time, he looked like Adonis, about 220 pounds, six feet three, completely tanned, you know, and he was a cliff diver in Acapulco. He'd had several championships in these various lumberjack competitions. <laughs> He was a triathlon and a decathlon champion. He, he, every sport he, he played, he was the hero in. And this had held some of this aggressive energy. Um, but through the slow, agonizing process of, um, of the work, and of course, I had to join him in this. And the one place where we actually shared uh, some of this energy was we, had both, uh, we both were house builders. My wife and I bought some property and, and I sort of built this house with help uh, that over the course of 20 years. And this patient had also done this. And we both had <laughs> a 
this will amuse you. We both had garden tractors with front end loaders. <laughs> And I had bought an old John Deere garden tractor with a front end loader and had done all the rock work on our property and so forth. And he had a Kubota. And so we had this shared world of macho men with our tractors. And of course his tractor was bigger than mine. And, And so when he refers back to this early stage in the therapy, he said, well, thank God for all the Kubota music we made together because I never could have entered therapy with you if you hadn't shared some of this. So we had enough of that sort of male, uh, that, that kind of extremist, uh, you know, sort of macho male stuff together so that he could let down into the hours and show me the, the lost little boy in himself. And over that time, he you know, started to settle, started to come down into himself, and um, the dream process uh, was just uh, incredible. I wrote that case up, actually. If you are interested, you can find it in a 35-page um, exposition in the Union Seminary Quarterly Review, uh, a double-issue festschrift for Ann Ulanoff, who uh, had 30 years of work in 1998. It's the 1998 double issue of the Union Seminary Quarterly Review. Um, I think it's called Transference and the Transpersonal. But it's a, a really a description about this guy coming down. This is a long way around to, your, to an answer to your question. Um, he then had another crisis in his life. Um, and he came back to therapy after a hiatus of three or four years. And all the old defenses were back in place. However, he had a consciousness of them and was working with them in a, in a much different way. Um, you know, the old counter-dependent macho facade, the old tyrannical inner voices, the sort of kick-ass attitude, his own intolerance for himself, for his own vulnerable feelings and his intolerance uh, for what he had gotten himself tangled up in, were all back. However, the work we had done through those earlier times gave us a real deep connection and he was able to work through that in a very quick way. Um, but he knew he needed help this time and he came back into therapy. But yeah, step backward, you know. The old, the old demons, you know, it's like that angel in that story I told yesterday with the little girl. Um, that angel will stay around in the psyche and in times of real need and desperation, she'll rescue or the, you know, the, the defense will come in, the protector, persecutor, will come back in and take up uh, the survival that's necessary to get this person through life again. Hopefully, with therapeutic work, um, the defense is softer and more transparent and the person is more in touch with the vulnerable feelings, the feminine feelings, and this guy was. So uh, it didn't take long for us to work through it a second time. Yes, Pete? Take the microphone, would you? I guess I've got a couple of questions. Have I heard you say, Don, that um, we all, to some degree to another, <clears throat> or another, regardless of our early childhood experiences, develop these defen this defensive structure? Yeah. And have I also heard you say that <clears throat> the psyche has a um, a propensity to erode that structure. I mean, it, uh, the individuation now, urge uh, always is is trying to break the boundaries of the defensive system. Yes. So we're all, to some degree or another, on a collision course with that structure. In dealing or in with yeah, or in a constant conflict with it. Well, do you feel that, that that could manifest in uh, depression? That oh, this, absolutely. This, um, yeah. That's absolutely. so prevalent. Yeah. You know, maybe it would be worth, uh, in responding to your question, Pete, it would be worth my trying to find this quote of, of um, Jung's where he dis differentiates between two kinds of complexes. Uh, I have it here somewhere. Um, well, I'm not sure I need the quote. 
I think of it this way. Um, most of us who end up healthy neurotics, uh, if we can call ourselves that, you know, uh, have had a reasonably well-mediated childhood experience where not a whole lot of experience that was unbearable or terrifying had to be uh, split off. It, in other words, um, this young ge gentleman, is it Ken? Kevin. Kevin was telling me uh, over the break, um, why don't you tell the story about the dream catcher if you could? Because it, it's, it's really uh, a great story. I have a, uh, well she's five now, but she was four at the time, and she started having a series of nightmares where she'd come into our room kind of whimpering that she'd had a bad dream and it was either a dragon or a bear or something that <clears throat> would come into her room. and. When we were away at a family reunion up in Lewisburg, West Virginia, we went into a um, little new age shop there and they, were, they had dream catchers. One of them was a small one and it was really very feminine, very pretty and uh, had little silver beads in it. And so I got it for them and for both my girls, but uh, for this one in particular and told her the mythology behind it that it catches the bad dreams and lets the good dreams in. And um, <clears throat> so we put it up in their room when we got back and for a while the dreams, the bad dreams stopped. And then she had one more, and um, I was saying earlier, she came in the room and said, Daddy, the dream catcher didn't work. And I said, well, we can adjust it a little bit. <laughs> 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 so I went in and I showed her how I was adjusting it, and she hasn't had a bad dream since. <laughs> Maybe we should all go out of business and just start producing dream catchers. We split their rooms up when we split the girls up, and my oldest one got her own room. <clears throat> she wanted to take the dream catcher. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the, that, that's a wonderful story, and, and it gets to my point that I was uh, making in reference to your question, Pete. It's, it's like we all have to metabolize this archetypal material that is a part of our unconscious when we're little. You know, the daimonic level of the, of the psyche you know, these are volcanic affects, and, and the way they're represented to the child's immature ego is in terms of archetypal imagery. And so childhood is universally an insecure time, and if there are good figures around, like mom and dad, who will help reassure the child and metabolize this and, and, and get dream catchers and help, help with various means to, to uh, intervene and, and mediate the, the, the dark energies of the, of the unconscious um, and also permit the inflations. Um, I, I have this memory from my own childhood which um, came up in the course of my own analysis um, because I've been feeling guilty about it. I've been carrying this guilt around about this. I went to my first basketball game at the Marshfield Gymnasium when I was about eight years old. And I sat above the basket where these big boys that I idealized ran up and down the court and would dunk the ball and all this. And I came home and I, the memory I have is telling my parents about that basketball game. And I told a pack of lies that were the most elaborated, creative, ideas about what a basketball game was. I told about people flying through the air and going upside down and putting the basket, the ball through the hoop and all kinds of manner of things. And as I told this story, I knew I was lying. Or was I? You see, <clears throat> as, I, as I look back at that moment, it was a moment of total creative inflation, right? The story I was telling was part real and part my total heroic imagination and idealization of these boys and, and uh, being on stage with my parents and showing off this phantasmagoric story and all this, and they received it. Now it would have been a very different experience if they said, oh that's bullshit, come on, people can't do that. Right? So part of what has to be metabolized is Parents are also there, and therapists and people in general, we're also there for each other's creative inflations. 
and grandparents. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> uh, let me just complete the thought and then, then we'll... Uh, so we all have those energies in us, either ecstatic energies of inflation and, um, and bliss and love and creativity, or dark uh, energies of volcanic affects that, that have to do with violence, rage, aggression, dismemberment of the psyche. Um, so the defense that I'm describing, for, for those of us who have had it, had those energies reasonably well mediated, it doesn't get so rigid. It, the defense isn't as rigid. And um, in Jung's differentiation between these complexes, he said there are some complexes, the healthy neurotic ones, where the ego alien material is in conflict with the way we like to see ourselves, our ego ideal, and maybe even it gets dissociated a little bit or split off a little bit or repressed. But it's been home in the ego once. So it's exile. When it returns, like the prodigal son, its return is experienced as wholeness. You know, if you tell a guilty secret to somebody you love, you feel shame and guilt and embarrassment. But if they accept you with your secret, you feel a tremendous sense of gratitude and wholeness because you've owned a piece of yourself that hasn't been a part of relationship before. Now, with early trauma, that material which has been exiled has never been home in the ego before. The defense has come in to banish it before it's been registered as a part of the self. Do you understand that? So integration of the ego alien material is the worst imaginable thing. So you don't do a classical Jungian analysis with somebody with trauma because you, you can't expect them to be happy to reintegrate the experience that's, that's been so damaging and so anxiety producing that it's fragmented their souls. It has to happen a little at a time in metabolizable doses. And that's part of the, that slow skein by skein uh, trip by trip, psychotherapy session by session that, that we were talking about last time. So that gives you some answer, Pete, about how I see it. You know, I think we all have this stuff in us for people who have had the privilege and are lucky enough to have it reasonably well mediated. We don't necessarily get taken over or quite as possessed by the, uh, by the daimonic side of the defense as other individuals who, who have had to use that, the defense has been necessary to help them survive. And so it's a little bit more clear in that material. It's one of the reasons I present these dreams of people who've suffered a lot of early trauma because, and neither one nor the other is better. It's, it's, it's simply, life is traumatic. We all have this in us. Uh, we just have to become sensitive to the fact that once the defenses are established, life can become more and more constricted. We, can, we become victims, uh, we, we're survivors, but we, we can't live fully, and so that's the issue. That's a very long way around, but I hope that speaks into it. Now there's another question back here, yes. Microphone. You may have answered it if I'd been patient. Okay. Right? <laughs> but you said your parents received it. Did they receive it as, in your mind, as absolute truth, or did they receive it as how cute? I mean, <laughs> a, a, you know, a, a they never healthy, told me a healthy. I had a kid one time who came to me, who was sent to me by a local <coughs> department of social services because he was lying mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. and he came to me and started telling me one of his stories. It was, long ordeal and when he finished 
I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I think it worked. But he, I said, it's fun to tell stories like that, isn't it? And he smiled and he said, yeah. <laughs> and he went home and he told his mama he loved me. He thought I was great because I knew he was just telling stories and everybody else seemed to be taking yeah. it seriously. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was like these stupid people don't seem to understand I want to play. Well, you know, that's a wonderful example because you not only um, received his story, but you you saw through the story that he was using to elevate his self-esteem, but accepted him. and. And that was a beautiful interchange. He needed to know that you wouldn't take that story as literal truth because otherwise he would have hidden in it. You see, and that's a totally different situation. Um, R.D. Lang once said, no doubt there are, are many very good reasons not to tell a lie, but the inability to do so is not one of them. <laughs> Now, I always was interested in that because what Lang meant, I think, was that sometimes it's necessary to tell a lie to create that place in, inside yourself where nobody can penetrate, where you, where you alone have sanctuary and, and, and authority. But if you create a whole life out of that kind of a lie, then you're started down the wrong path. But you can get locked into it. You can get locked into you it, absolutely. You don't have some way of, of escaping yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Somebody who will let you do it, but no, it's not real. That's anymore. right. Yeah, because, you know, the lie, another way to look at the lie is that it's part of the phantasmagoria created by your inner daimon to create soothing for a, a part of yourself that, that's in hiding. And so instead of getting self-esteem through ego mastery and ego agency in the world and feeling and relationship, you get self-esteem through the phantasmagoric story that, that you start to weave around yourself, right? Or, or that the defense weaves around you. And then pretty soon you're a false, you're totally a false self. And um, the individuating person inside you that wants to live and doesn't want to just survive won't be happy with that and will we'll relish moments like, like that moment with you where you can see through and, and still accept the child. Yeah. Yes? I'm sorry, could you say that in the microphone? Because I couldn't hear it either. <laughs> Somebody sent me a quote that said, lie boldly, for the grace of God is boundless. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the other side, isn't it? <laughs> Reminds me of somebody who also said, squander yourself on life. It's, it's, it's a little bit in that same, same genre, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, you were talking previously about the woman who came to you that was involved in healing. Yes. Which she had the, you know, um, where the people the dark were, energy the was also and coming. The, and was moving, and she had these fantasies about killing, right. killing children. I was wondering if she stayed with you and how all of that evolved out. Uh -huh. I was curious to know how she integrated that and and if that changed her her approach to life and healing and her interests. Uh, if you could share that. Yeah. Um, oh boy, that's a long story. Um, she stayed with me for a period of three to four years, and by the time she left, I think we had had a very stormy process uh, where um, she would direct some of that energy at me. For example, one time she told me she wanted my plane to go down on a trip I was making to South Africa and that she uh, had wished for this to happen, and she confessed this to me. Now, um, needless to say, I was not pleased uh, <laughs> to hear this. Um, but in the confession of it, she also provided the other side of her feeling reality, which is that she felt terrible about it. And in other words, she could externalize some of this with me. She couldn't tell these, this pregnant mother that she wished her baby dead, but she could tell her therapist that she was so furious about me leaving 
that she wanted to destroy me. And in my surviving that destruction and helping her to own both sides of her feelings and the truer side of what she felt in the attachment to me and how angry she was as I separated, she began to feel a bigger space in which the positive and negative side of her energy could come into the therapy. And we had a very stormy um, kind of process because um, one part of her wanted to crawl into the therapy and make it her, what she called her higher power. Um, she was also in the AA process and 12-step programs. And another part of her, um, in other words, one part of her wanted to start to depend on me and the therapy and really believe in the process that was going on between us. And the other part of her resisted that tremendously and was um, so anxious and so upset as she allowed herself to drop into that dependency because I went away a lot. And finally, you know, um, you know, she, she took me up in areas that uh, were very hard for me to hear um, because to some extent she was right. I mean, th this is a woman who said to me, look, you hold yourself out as a trauma expert. I'm traumatized. And yet you go away every eight weeks. How am I supposed to work here? This is irresponsible. Okay? Now, what am I going to say to that? I mean, she's right. Um, if, if I, and, and, and this of course had to do with how I represented myself at the beginning, because I didn't clarify with her that I'm away a lot, and that that's part of the way I'm leading my life now. I mean, if she had seen me 20 years ago, I would have been the therapist maybe that she needed. But she had to leave because she couldn't really do the work with me because she was too angry about all the interruptions. And I had to honor that and refer her to somebody that was able to be there with her. I don't know the results of that, except what I do know is that she was a person of enormous psychological depth and integrity. And um, I admired her tremendously. And I feel like the work we did did help her because she could own more of her stuff. I don't think she'd ever had a place. The previous therapist that she'd worked with was great for the warm, fuzzy stuff, but when she got into her anger, she felt like she was always destroying her. And with me, she could have her rage. And that's most of what we worked with. And I had to be honest you know, with her about how she was affecting me. Sometimes it would really devastate me to hear her criticisms. Other times, she would become literally abusive of me, and I would have to stop her and say, look, you, you, you know, this conversation can go this far, but it can't go that far. I'm not going to sit here and, and just listen to your contempt because it, it doesn't feel like it's going to be helpful to either one of us. And she would honor that. In other words, I was, in a way, uh, having to pry her ego away from her demon and liberate her internally from their identification with this demonic affect, which would get control over her and take over the session. Sometimes she'd leave and sweep books off my shelf in a rage, slam the door, and walk out. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the last thing I want to do is paint a rosy picture about the work with these people, because it's never easy, and it's never smooth, and it's never... Um, it's never this wonderful redemption story that uh, my colleagues uh, who, uh, who do the sort of New Age circuit uh, are always talking about in their blurbs. Uh, every time I read one of these redemption stories, I, I want to say, uh, God, how do you do it, you know? How does it happen? It's, it's always so messy for me. It's always so, it takes so long. It's always such a agony in, in my experience of the process. Um, do these things really work that well? Uh, then I think I should go take their workshops and then I... <laughs>
and I, somehow I never do. <laughs> I tell myself I don't have time. Do you ask this though to remind you to tell you the story of this? Oh, or a featuring this? Yeah. Um, recently, I've gotten interested in another fairy tale, uh, which actually probably is a good segue for Fitcher's Bird, which we haven't even gotten to yet, and it's now time. So I'll tell it as an ending, and then we can come back this afternoon. We'll, we'll plunge right into the fairy tale. Um, this fairy tale is Dante's uh, Commedia, the Divine Comedy, which maybe you know um, was written, the first words of, of the Divine Comedy are um, in the middle of the journey of, this journey that we're all on, I found myself in a dark wood, lost, depressed. So in Dante's imaginal journey, he, he hooks up with Virgil, his favorite poet. And these two poets make a descent into hell. And they have to go down. The poet's depressed, so the, the remedy for this depression is a journey into hell, sort of a homeopathic remedy. <clears throat> darkness to darkness, OK? Uh, and that's the first, um, the, the first part of the, the Divine Comedy. Then, then there's the Purgatorio, there's the Inferno, Purgatorio, and the Paradiso. Ultimately, there's a vision at the end of the book, which has to do with, um, with a, a vision of the self, uh, but a trinity in which the human form is also seen. But, this descent into the inferno has always intrigued me because uh, hell is not a bad image for the encapsulated world of the traumatized psyche. The tortures that we see represented in Hades, um, dismemberment, the, the pains of the flames, the, the whole uh, retribution, punishment for all the sins of the flesh and so forth are really an outpicturing of, of a kind of torturing that goes on inside um, under the supervision of the demon who rules this subterranean realm. And the other interesting thing I got interested in, this is 20 years ago, was that in the um, medieval celebration of the, uh, of the resurrection story and the crucifixion, Christ himself enters hell. It's called the harrowing of hell, and it happens between his death on the cross and his resurrection three days later. He descends into hell, and one of the things he does there, according to the medieval um, imagination, he struggles with the devil, with Satan. He breaks the locks on the crypt of hell, and he liberates the souls who are trapped there in limbo. Now, isn't that fascinating? And guess who's in limbo? The babies. Infants who were not baptized, and the righteous who lived before the coming of Christ. So, good people that the medieval imagination, the Catholic imagination, couldn't really subject to the fires and the pains of deep hell, so they put them in the upper hell, where they suffered a, a, a loss, an endless wailing of the beatific vision. So that's the first level that Christ penetrated when he went down, and it's the first level that Virgil and Dante penetrate as they go down into the deepest levels. And it's like a funnel. They go down and down and down. They finally, at the, at the sixth circle, they confront the gates of Dis. Now, the gates of Dis is the nether hell. That's where the really terrifying things come up. And uh, the imagery from this journey has been part of the popular imagination for 700 years now. Uh, Giotto, Botticelli, some of the greatest artists of the medieval period and the Renaissance have painted this journey. And then in the modern period, their journey and the imagery about it has been collected in a book called Images of the Journey, 
in Dante's Divine Comedy, published by two friends of mine, both Jungian analysts, um, Pat Finley and Charlie Taylor, Finley and Taylor, Im Images of the Journey in Dante's Divine Comedy. And so you can see this, uh, but I, I became fascinated. When this book came out, I didn't realize uh, how interesting this was in terms of the work I was doing on the trauma complex. To make a long story short, when they find their way finally down through the various circles of, you know, their images of splitting, people are split in two, people are dismembered, ghosts of the, of the past are rising from the tombs talking to them. In the very deepest level, they walk across the frozen river of Costas with the heads of dismembered and grotesque figures crying out to them out of the ice. And there, in the deepest, darkest layer of hell, is a three-handed monster with one sinner being bitten in half in each of these three maws, drooling and bleeding down its three chins. And the name that Dante gives to this figure is not the devil, not Satan, not Beelzebub, Dis. Dis. Dismemberment, disease, disgrace, dissociation. Disaster, which means to come separated from the stars. Disaster means you lose your starlit destiny. So at the very core of this trauma complex is a disintegrating, dissociating, dismembering energy. And this is the image that Dante had of abject, absolute evil. So evil is dis. And so the poem asks us to imagine that at the very core of, of the darkest level of our defenses of dissociation, embodying all this violence and aggression and rage, is this personification of the worst imaginable force in the universe, the disintegrating energies of the cosmos. Now, the other side of this is the integrating love of the cosmos, right? The energies that have to do with pulling together and making whole and integration. And from, from this discussion, we also, we, we also get the, uh, the words di diabolic and symbolic. Diabolic means to split, separate, to throw away from. Symbolic means to bring together. So the healing and holing energies of the psyche and of the cosmos seem to have to do with that integrative part. The disintegration is the other side of the cosmos. And we know dis isn't all bad. Differentiation requires aggression. So it's just that when you get its image in this worst imaginable form, where the anger has been all taken over by the defensive world, you get this image of dis. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. I mean, here's one of the great myths of our Western civilization. It's really talking about exactly this disintegrative energy. So that'll be a part of my next book uh, whenever it comes out. So <laughs> you can see whatever form that takes. You were, you were part of the creation of that chapter right here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's go to lunch. Yeah. Okay, um, are there particular questions or um, loose ends that we want to try to talk about before? Oops, we just lost our microphone. No, we didn't. No, we didn't. Jerry, uh, we, we do need the mic because uh, it's a big help as far as the taping is concerned. Don, I'm particularly interested in the uh, dream imagery mm -hmm. of uh, trauma patients and uh, both examples you've already used and many examples in your book. Right. Um, as we know, the dream imagery of healthy neurotic people or 
less traumatized persons also carry uh, sometimes gross or violent or even dismembering mm -hmm. imagery. Right. Are there ways to differentiate uh, the dream material between um, trauma victims and more or less normal neurotic imagery? What have you learned that is the, uh, it's a question of differentiating, I think. Yeah, you know, it's, um, one of the, one of the uh, real factors is how much of this imagery can you take? In other words, if you have a, a, a violent image, um, does it just scare you to death and make you not want to talk about the dream? Or can you talk about the anger uh, that you might feel unconsciously around whatever constellated the dream? In other words, we all have breakthrough imagery from the collective layer of the psyche. Um, so we're going to find these collective images in our dream material, particularly around uh, major life transitions or around you know big dreams that occur um, that open us up to whole other parts of ourselves that we really haven't been dealing with, compensate our ego attitudes. But generally, you know, the differentiation is in the person who's having the dream and is working in the therapy. It's um, the ability to the, the ability to that. to work with it, the ability to work with the material. Um, you know, when I first went through training in New York Young Institute, it was pretty much understood that you didn't work with dream material of the so-called borderline personalities. Uh, that what they needed is a reductive analysis. Well, that was our old way of saying some people are going to have archaic and volcanic and overwhelming imagery coming up from the unconscious that, that they're not going to be able to work with yet because it's just overwhelming. And so those people tend to you know, exist in a sort of, um, in, in the world of the archetypes and they need to be better grounded. They need to be, so you have to reduce that material. So the last thing you do with somebody like that is um, when they have a, a violent image right out of mythology is uh, get them all enthralled in the mythological psyche because you're trying to get them back into this world, this life, this moment, and so on. So it really has to do with the relative ego strength and resiliency of the person you're working with. You can't tell from the material necessarily. Other questions that came up? Uh, yes. Pass the mic over. Relative, I think, to that in some way, in my own therapeutic process or in analysis, sometimes when I've gone into a deep place and begun to have images of or, or emotional affect surrounding some images, um, I've experienced a, a fear maybe from all that was written about false memories mm. and have been afraid to stay with something or follow something out of a fear of false memory. Is there a way to differentiate? I mean, is that just another defense against going somewhere that's traumatic and painful? Or um, can you address that at all? Well, you see, when you're working in the psyche, um, you, you have to have an attitude that what comes up is psychologically true. Um, and its meaning has to be explored and uncovered slowly with that attitude. The false memory, true memory debate uh, you know, leaves the psyche behind and, and uh, goes into, uh, did this really happen to you or not? And of course, the best attitude is an attitude of open and un unknowingness and openness about whether it happened. But if you're having this spontaneous imagery, you know that something is being referred to. Uh, if there wasn't a literal violation, maybe it was a symbolic violation. Um, there are certain things you can, if you work with this material long enough, you sort of get a feeling for what feels like it's likely to have been true in the person's literal life 
and then there's a whole other spectrum where you don't know whether did this actually happen to this person uh, is this the way the psyche is organizing what happened to this person was it a violation of their body space literally by the father was it a violation of their psychological space by the mother say oftentimes we're, le we're left without knowing but we do take it seriously because it It, it, it's psychologically true. See, this is, this is why Jung had so much trouble with, with so many people. Well, are you talking about God or aren't you? The theologians took him to task all the time. And he kept saying, I'm talking about the image of God in the human psyche. I can't say anything about God. That's for you theologians to figure out. I can only say what people are experiencing, and it's a deep, meaningful experience. So we don't, we take it as a deep, meaningful experience in the psyche. Now, sometimes people, you know, who have a trauma history need to take up the possibility that something really dreadful did happen to them. Uh, otherwise, you know, if you swim around only in the psyche with such a person, you do them a disservice because they, they uh, are very inclined to think it's all their fault. And it's very important as part of the healing process for trauma patients to begin to realize that, you know, there was a serious uh, breach of something in their childhoods and that it wasn't their fault, that something happened. Um, so... You know, like, for example, a patient of mine who's having flashback experiences in the sessions when she relaxes, like that girl with the screen door slamming. She thought she was crazy because that was happening to her. Now, if I had taken that symbolically, well, let's see. Let's go to our symbol dictionaries and look up screen doors. <laughs> right? I knew that that was, was a flashback experience, that that was a piece of a fragmented memory. So I pursued it with her. Uh, whereas if it had been a dream, only a dream with just an image like that, I might not have. I might have wondered more what was being symbolized. You have to sort of feel your way in this material, and it's always hard. Yeah. I'm interested to know if you've seen cases in which the tyrannical protector is actually projected onto a partner in life. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. It happens all the time. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm curious then how you work with that. Uh, mm. uh, unless I'm doing conjoint therapy, I don't work with it uh, very well because uh, the person is usually completely... Uh, unable to see what they're doing until right. there's a crisis. Um, you know, one of the most common things that happens in this sadomasochistic structure is that, um, which is what this trauma complex is. It's right. a sadomasochistic structure. That's how it gets organized in human relationships oftentimes. So, you know, um, the person will... Uh, will take on the daimonic persecutory figure and start after the spouse or the partner or whatever until they've created... You see, the, 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 the daimonic defense comes out of injury, right? Unowned injury. So you beat up on your partner until you create the same hurt in your partner that you feel unconsciously. Or vice versa. Or right? vice versa. And then, then, just to stay with that analogy, you beat up on your partner until they break down into tears and you see the pain that you've caused. And then, oh my God, then sometimes um, 
you can see through what you've been doing and you can see through the projection that you've let them carry for you and you can re-own the pain that you were in somewhere. But that takes very conscious couples work and conscious uh, work. Whereas if I just have the, the, the wife or the husband in therapy and they're demonizing their wife or demonizing their husband, uh, I always now wonder to myself, well, this is at least one half of the story. You know, um, early on in my career, I was much more inclined to take the story of a patient about a spouse as literal truth and uh, got myself into some trouble by siding with the patient too much. Now I'm, I'm much more inclined to wonder, well, what, what is your partner carrying for you here? And, and what's the other side of it? And it sounds like that's something that would be understood in later stages of therapy. Yes, I agree. Yeah, pretty advanced. Yeah, pretty advanced, yeah. right. Where, where somebody's self-esteem is no longer so brittle that they need the inflation of the daimonic identifications. You know, you, you're, you're a righteous victim. You know, the complex is, is such a mess because, you know, I, I talk about it in different places where I've written about this as the queen baby complex. The queen what? The queen baby. Oh, okay. okay, there's the tyrannical, imperious, queenly side of the thing, off with your head attitude. And then there's the abject, innocent, vulnerable, helpless place. You put the two together and you have an absolutely uh, explosive combination of tyrannical infantilism. Because the person can demand reparations for all the victimization that they've experienced. And they can make a cause celeb about all of the trauma they've experienced. And they can pretty much convince you that you owe them reparations for all this trauma. Well, you the therapist or the world? And I often listen to that and hear it as the infant speaking through the queen. And you can't generally separate the two because it's such a powerful thing, you know? Because once such an individual gets on their soapbox, um, it's very difficult to get them off. I mean, and we live in a culture right now in which victimism has become uh, rampant. I mean, I'm, I'm no uh, advocate of smoking, but you know, when I read that um, 500,000 smokers in Florida have sued the tobacco company and gotten a settlement for $1.5 billion because they're victims of the tobacco companies hiding the fact that smoke was dangerous. I have to ask myself, well, where is personal responsibility going in this culture? Does anybody think smoking was good for you? You know? So right now, if you trip and fall down on the sidewalk in front of your, you know, your therapist's office, we all have to carry huge malpractice insurance because you know, you, they m might be a victim of your neglect. And of course, this is the other side of the pendulum swing from all the lack of, of help that people have gotten over the years and the way that they've felt exploited by big corporations and all the rest of it. But there's a real shadow side to all this, uh, all of our newfound sensitivity to trauma right now. Jim Hillman is on a tear about this. Um, he, uh, he says, you know, we've had 100 years of therapy and, and we're, we're worse off than we ever were. And, of course, I always amuse myself with the realization that people that talk like that have given up the process of therapy 20 years ago, and they're no longer doing it either. So, yeah. um, But he's got a point. You know, he has a point that, that we're all sort of pulling into solving our wounds, and the culture around us is in deep need of attention, and we, we need to pay attention to what's going on in the real world as well as in our wounded psyches. So there's two sides to this issue. But the queen baby or the king baby, that, I borrowed that from Harold Searles. Um, it's a, 
it's a very powerful combination. Um, and uh, you can feel very guilty for um, a long time if, if you let a queen baby tell you all the terrible things that you've done or not done um, in the course of your well-meaning efforts to help them. Um, and once you confront that, what's interesting is that often the person is relieved to be liberated from this sort of possession by that rageful place that they get into of going after somebody or um, what you hope for is a breakdown of the tyrannical defense so that you get to the human interhuman relationship okay I don't know, I, I have a feeling I said too much in this last piece that it probably is controversial, probably is inflammatory, probably I, I said a bunch of half-truths just now that um, you all probably are having reactions to, so we'll make space for that. Um, there are two sides to this story, very much so, and I'm trying to find the middle ground in which uh, we can honor the tremendous amount of traumatizing experience that we've all had and yet not identify as victims and take responsibility for the ways in which we are now responsible for our own lives and we can't just keep laying this at the hands of the, the bad people that uh, we'd like to make evil. Yeah. In order for, there's, there seems to be this idea that in order for me to get better, I have to be responsible for my own pain. And I think that I don't have to be responsible for my wounding to be re responsible for my getting well. Mm. That's a nice way of putting it. That's right. Yeah, and, you know, responsible for my own pain and responsible to my own life. You know, because life is always wanting to unfold and there's always the individuation urge that one has to be responsible to as well as the, as the places where the individuation process has been derailed. Um, you know, vengeance doesn't usually lead to healing. And yet, as a part of the trauma complex, there's a tremendous vengeful uh, rage that wants to hurt because of how deeply we've been hurt. And it's not for no reason that the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. In other words, not yours. Uh, I'll, I'll take that, that's the God stuff. Um, you don't have to go out and murder all the people that have, have murdered you. So. We're right in one of these complexes as a nation right now. American innocents and evil perpetrators are, are, are split right now in the culture. You really can't talk about ways in which maybe we are responsible for some of the stuff that's now coming back to us because it's, it's, it's a culture in which right now what happened to us is so heinous that any shades of gray or shades of, of, of a dialogue here are, are hard to talk about in the, in the political climate that we're in right now. Um, all of us bleeding, pardon? Did he? I, you know, I heard some vague thing about Turner's making some comments and then having to retract or clarify that he really wanted to acknowledge that this was a terrible thing and I don't know what he said before that, but, um, yeah, well, I can see why he got in trouble for that. <laughs> you know, because what it doesn't acknowledge is just how incredibly lost uh, these folks are in their own fundamentalism. and. Um, you know, that's the part of this trauma complex. When you fall 
you know, Tom Friedman in the New York Times makes the point. Um, this kind of religious fanaticism and fundamentalism doesn't make for failed communities and failed states. Failed states make for this fundamentalism. In other words, if you come out of a culture for 20 years in which you've had no vehicles for your own self-expression and no vehicles for your own evolution, um, you have been fundamentally deprived of the most deeply needful things that, that human culture provides. And, and when you fall into the, the substratum, the religious fanatical substratum of the archetypal psyche, uh, you're down in this trauma complex. And, and uh, you know, you heard it in bin Laden's early discussions of the reason that this had happened was because of all those babies, those Iraqi babies that were killed by American bombing. That's how he justified the World Trade Center disaster is, is the, the dead babies. Now, so there again, you hear that same ruthless combination of, of innocence and violence that's justified in the name of innocence. Um, and, and there's something that doesn't quite compute there, isn't there? Right? Because you, you're, you're, on a, you're, you're going to kill innocents in order to, to, to right the wrongs to innocents. So you can never get out of this cycle. It's, um, and so you can't argue out of this cycle. You can only suffer out of this cycle. You can only suffer the woundedness. Um, and I thought the period in this country, the three weeks right after the, the attack when the government wasn't saying anything and we were all struggling and trying to figure out and we didn't know how to respond, that that was a terribly pregnant time in our national life, that people were really grappling with this. What was its meaning? Um, Islamic bookstores were selling out. People were trying to understand what is Islam? Is this related to Islam? Is it not? What's what is Afghanistan? What's the culture over there? We're, we're starting to be informed about other aspects of the world. That was a very important time. It was a time of unknowing, a time of suffering, a time of... Uh, and uh, it's a little different than where we are now, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, I want to just ask something. As we descend into this conversation, do you notice yourself becoming angry? Some of you? Well, look, uh, I appreciate what you're saying. And the idea of all the facts out and it gets to the point of complexity. This is so complex, and we're all so anxious in the presence of this complexity, we cannot afford complexity. This is a trauma psychology. So what you do if you have to orient yourself and recover your wounded self-esteem in the presence of this kind of complexity, you, you find yourself simplifying the story. And the point I'm making is that <laughs> these fundaments are part of the, of the psyche good and evil, innocence and experience. They're part of the psyche and they're parts of where we go when we need to organize ourselves and, and to organize our self-esteem when it's been so hurt and we're so unclear and confused about what is happening. Um, that's we have to recover complexity. We have to recover the human and the interhuman. I think the Olympics are making a huge contribution to the healing of our country because it's all people, you know, and it's when those Iranian athletes come into this stadium and the American people are cheering them, it brings tears to my eyes. It's like, you know, all people, everyone has the same valid right to exist on the planet. And, um, you know, that humiliation quotient that you're talking about, even Colin Powell recognizes this. He says, 
we have to reduce the humiliation of the people in the Israeli-Palestinian situation because that is what is fueling the vengeance and that is what is fueling the constant um, tyrannical splitting between innocence and good and evil and perpetration. And so, yeah, I mean, trauma is about humiliation. It's a humiliation of the self. And when the self is humiliated, self-esteem has to be recovered. And the way we do it is through this splitting and through these religious categories. It's just seems to be the nature of the psyche that we repair to religious categories when we've lost the human and the interhuman ways of holding self-esteem and, and love and connection. So I don't want us to get...